Now we have said the choose the modes, the tenor volume, the peep, and we need to choose the FI2 and um, the PO2 target. So maybe everyone, if you are listening to us, and you can explain us what are the goals and how do should we set FI2 for a patient in in ERDS, but also in perioperative medicine. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jean-Michel. Um, do you have my slides? I have your uh, picture now, and your slides are coming, I hope. Okay, oh, so thank you for the invitation. So I'm not sure that I will be totally able to, to answer the, the complete question. Um, first of all, next slide. Uh, I must say that I have several conflicts of interest with such a topic, just because with my friend and colleague Francois Lerouche, several years ago, we just developed a, a closed loop system that was dedicated to adjust oxygen flow uh, for spontaneously breathing patients. So next slide. So we all know, all, all clinicians know that our main goal are to avoid hypoxemia just because oxygen is the metabolic fuel of the human system. That is quite obvious for everyone, but what clinicians are not totally aware, next slide, is that if we should avoid hypoxemia, we should also avoid hyperoxia, just because there are several, several uh, ways that hyperoxia should be, should be deleterious. In the literature, at least in terms of physiopathology, we have a, a huge amount of data showing us that hyperoxia should be deleterious. Uh, there are several point of view, uh, experts advice, but now we are beginning to, to get very strong clinical, uh, clinical evidence that that should be a, a main goal for us. So next slide. If we just have a look at PubMed, the, the PubMed publication during the last year. Uh, hyperoxia is just beginning to be a major topic. Uh, in, in less than 20 years, we, we gain uh, several hundreds of publications on the topic. Next. Um, next slide. Uh, the, the, the main reason why uh, hyperoxia should be deleterious is mainly just because it increases the, the oxidative stress. Uh, we all know by now that the oxidative stress uh, may increase apoptosis. Uh, we also know that it may increase inflammation. And there are very ancient uh, evidence that oxygen by itself has deleterious effects uh, in terms of vasoconstrictive, uh, vasoconstrictive effects. Uh, next slide. Uh, there, there are, in fact, several guidelines in the literature about how and where to set the SpO2 value uh, of our patients. Uh, but of course, the, these guidelines are mainly based on experts' advice. We, the, the accepted minimal SpO2 value, at least in the ICU or in the ARDS patients, are, are quite well known. Uh, for the standard ICU patients, we should um, we should set uh, our minimal SpO2 value to 92%, and in ARDS patients, we could decrease it to 88%. Um, but what is less used is the maximal SpO2 values that should be set to our patients. As you can see on this slide, if we just look, have a look at the British Thoracic Society guidelines, so these are the ancient version in 2008, but the, the BTS guidelines on oxygen settings has been modified just last year. Uh, for ICU patients, we, we, we should reach, at least for everybody, a uh, maximal SpO2 value of 98% at least. And for AADS patients, we should set the maximal SpO2 value to 92%. That does not mean that a patient should never have more than 92% uh, SpO2, but it means that 
uh, with, if the patients are more than 92% SpO2, we should decrease quite immediately the FiO2. And in fact, this is quite never, quite never done in the real practice. And if you just go back to your to your uh, units, you, you you should see that more than 50% of our patients are higher than the, the recommended um, SpO2 values. The next slide. And, and in fact, the, the, the study that totally modified our point of view in the ICU is a very, very recent study from Gerardis. So it's a RCT on more than 400 patients. Uh, they just randomized the patients to a SpO2 target that was considered as conservative, 94 to 92 uh, 98%, which is not so low than that. Uh, and they also randomized the patients to what was considered, considered as a conventional oxygen therapy range, uh, an SpO2 in between 97 to 100%, which is actually the, the, the most standard practice in most IV. And as you can see, um, the in terms of survival of the patients, the the study just depicted as a very very different uh, probability of survival. Even if if you just look at the at the right part of the slide, the, the mean the median the median PAO, PAO2 value was not so different. Uh, in the con conventional oxygen therapy uh, group, the PAO, mean, median PAO2 was only 100 millimeters of mercury. And in the conservative uh, oxygen therapy group, the median PAO2 was only 90, 90 millimeters of mercury. Next. But the ICU mortality of these patients was strictly different. And of it was decreased by an off just set in the patients that were set to the conservative oxygen therapy. So by now we have a huge bench of proofs, uh, at least from a physiopathologic point of view, that are telling us that we should uh, maintain a lower SpO2 value in our ICU patients. Uh, but now we are just beginning to, to, to get some very interesting uh, data on the fact that it really, really modified the outcome of our patients. So next, I think it's uh, the last one, just pick up. Uh, no, ju just next. Uh, and in fact, there are a, a huge uh, bench of evidence that such an approach should be the, the way to think for all types of patients, either patients with a, a myocardial infection, patients with a cerebral ischemia. Um, there, there are some beginning evidence that are clearly telling us that hyperoxia decreased cardiac output, decreased coronary flow, uh, increase the infarctor size of the myocardial infection. It also increased the in, uh, cerebral infarctor size for if we do not set the, the SpO2 value within the within the guidelines range. And we, there are beginning evidence that it also increased mortality for post cardiac arrest patients. Next. Uh, and I love that slide. I love that slide. It's a very simple one. It's a patient that was undergoing an angioplasty. You can see on the the left side, uh, the the left coronary has been revascularized. Uh, you can see that the flow is going on. And on the right side, uh, they just gave the patients. 100% uh, oxygen, and immediately, this is a real, real image, immediately, just providing, giving the patient 100 oxygen, immediately we observe the coronary vasoconstriction, very strict vasoconstriction. So there are numerous, numerous evidence. Next slide. 
and next next one and i love the also this image this is uh mri perfusion uh of LC patient, they, they just gave the patients uh, either CO2 to increase vasodilation or either oxygen just to prove that when we gave uh, oxygen to the patients, they are, we observed vasoconstriction. And such a vasoconstriction uh, in this study in, induced a very, a very high decrease of the cerebral flow. So there are so numerous uh, evidence that are telling us that whatever the types of the patient, whatever the types of the pathology, whatever the settings of clinical interest, we should be very strictly focused on maintaining the guidelines. So next. Um, probably the, the last one, so I, I will stop that. We, we have to finish uh, quickly, Aaron, please, because we have one question and yeah. we have to finish now. Now, that's the that's, uh, last, it's finished from for my point of view. I, I just asked the question, uh, answer the questions. Okay, thank you. So I have a one question from New Zealand uh, saying, that how could we decrease hyperoxia in our RICU uh, today? They are, they are, in fact, we, we know that if the nurse-to-patient ratio is too low to be able to, to maintain our patients within the guide, the, the goal. So I'm totally convinced that we should go on for closed-loop oxygen uh, adjustment. Uh, as I just told you initially, we developed with our colleague Francois a closed-loop system for spontaneously breathing patients. We have just published in the in the European Respiratory Journal in 2017 a study on the emergency department patients, just showing some very interesting results. And we are now doing with at least with Jean Michel a study on the postoperative patients that aims to prove in almost 200 patients uh, that. Closed loop will also be interesting in the post-operative settings. So the closed loop is, uh, at least from my point of view, the, the way we should go on. Thank you very much, Awan. Thank you to have joined us, and thank you for the quality of your talk. We are going to conclude, and I say only 20 to 30 seconds for each to give one or two messages, and ladies first. So, Liz, please. Then, uh, thanks a lot to everyone for these very uh, nice discussions, and my main point about those topics uh, is the following is first we have to apply what is demonstrated in the studies at the bedside every day and then try to individualize uh, mechanical ventilation thank you Mathieu. well with regards to tidal volume i would uh, point out <coughs> what Liz said uh, about the importance of setting this, the volume to monitor the pressure and lung mechanics and also what um, Samir Jaber said about the combination sometimes tricky um, when setting both PEEP and tidal volume. Uh, the main message would be to limit tidal volume and the range from 4 to 8 meters per uh, kilogram predicted body weight. I guess it's acceptable at this time. Thank you. In, a, in other words, what said Mathieu, please, when you decrease tidal volume, please increase PEEP. Please, if you increase too high PEEP, decrease tidal volume. This is a very important. We don't have time to speak about the driving pressure, but this is summarized what I'm But saying. this message is really important, yes. Sam, please. I want to ask to Erwan Lair what we are, what we see behind him. I is think it jacket? It, it, it will explain. Exactly? We don't understand, please. It will give you the Erwan. answer. But, 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 but by friends, uh, thank uh, for all. In five minutes, I will be diving. <laughs> thank you, Aaron. So thank you for everybody to have followed us. Uh, just a thought to our friend Gilles Capelier, who should have been with us, but have some issue uh, from a health point of view. Uh, we will be back in a few seconds with the next session of our meeting. Have a good day. Thanks for, to all, all over the world. And please adapt and personalize mechanical ventilation for your patient. Bye-bye. <laughs>